Greetings and welcome to another exciting edition of Poet to Poet. I'm Robert Dunn. I'm hosting today, as usual. We're coming to you from the Orange Bear in the City Hall area of Manhattan. And we're grateful to Vic for letting us come in and, uh, and do whatever it is that we do here. Actually, what we're doing today is going to be a very serious show. Uh, possibly the most serious uh, program that we've ever put on the air. Because our guest today is Paul Polanski, over here to my left who has two new books out, uh, but the subject of the books is another lesser-known Holocaust going on. In the Czech Republic, for the past five decades or so, there has been a campaign to eradicate the gypsy, or more formally, the Romani population. Actually, it's been going on for about 600 years. Um, that may be, but uh, at the moment, uh, it's become uh, even more crucial to find out about it than... Uh, yes, you wouldn't expect this could happen under a democracy. You wouldn't think that the Velvet Revolution actually started the latest phase, but it did. Especially when, uh, when you consider how much we know about what was really going on during World War II against a number of people, peoples, actually. Uh, the books are, one is poetry called Living Through It Twice. The other book is Oral Histories uh, from the survivors of what's going on called Black Silence. How did you get involved in the subject? Well, both of these books deal with the Gypsy Holocaust the Romanian Holocaust, and I was investigating Czech immigration to America in the 19th century when I discovered that the first village in Czechoslovakia to send immigrants to America was a small town in South Bohemia called Leti. And when I was investigating the original pioneers from Leti to America, the archive director said, do you know what happened in Leti during World War II? And I said, no. I saw Leti as the cradle of, of Czech immigration to America. And he said there was a gypsy death camp there, and everyone died, supposedly, of typhus. Mm -hmm. uh, but apparently not everybody died of typhus. Not everybody died, fortunately, but most of them did. Mm -hmm. And according to the survivors, the handful of survivors, they died from beatings, starvation, gassing, shootings, all done by the Czechs, not by the Germans. And this is the most horrific thing that has come out. Mm -hmm. Let's start then uh, in our examination of the books with the oral histories in Black Silence. Well, Black Silence is a book of 66 oral histories from survivors that I found. When I first started my research, I appealed to President Havel's office to help me find the survivors. The Czech police have a computer listing everyone living in the Czech Republic today. I asked them if they could help me find survivors. The president's office reported back to me that there were no survivors of Leti. I thought that was quite strange. You have a, a death camp and there's no survivors. And so I went out on my own. I went into the ghettos in the Czech Republic looking for the oldest gypsies, asking them if they knew any survivors. And slowly I started to find gypsy survivors who had been in Auschwitz, who had been in Leti, and they told me their stories. Mm -hmm. in, reading, uh, in reading the book, I was astonished, although I really shouldn't be, to find out that uh, many of the survivors felt that Leti was worse than Auschwitz. It's, it's a terrible thing to say, and, and I suppose you have to be careful because Auschwitz was the worst of all mm -hmm. the Holocaust camps. Certainly the most people died in Auschwitz. But the Leti survivors who were also at Auschwitz said that the brutality of the Czech guards was worse than the Germans. And at Auschwitz, uh, if you were able to survive morning roll call, you knew you were going to live for another day. While at Leti, you could be beaten to death at any instant, at any time, day or night. And this is what they had to live with. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an oral history? 
Well, I would like to read an oral history here of a son of a survivor because this oral history tells not only what happened during World War II, but what is happening today in the Czech Republic. I I'd called my poem book, Living Through It Twice, because the gypsy Holocaust survivors feel that they are living through what happened in 1939 again today. Mm -hmm. And I think this oral history explains it. According to the certificate I have here before me from the International Red Cross, my mother was in Auschwitz, Ravensbrück, Buchenwald, and Bergen-Belsen. Her Auschwitz number tattooed on her left arm was Z7960. The Red Cross certificate doesn't mention that my mother was in Leti, but that was her first concentration camp. She always said that the Czech guards were worse animals than the Germans. Leti was the first place she was ever in. She told me that after her husband and her three children had died in Leti, she was beaten almost every day with a wooden club. She said the food was horrible. They had soup with red beets made with dirty water. Normally, it would have been impossible to eat this food, but they had nothing else. She was sick in Leti. She had bronchitis. Her parents were arrested with her, but after arriving in Leti, she never saw them again. She would tell me how her children died. She wouldn't tell me how her children died. She would never talk about it. She saw many people murdered at Leti. They were mainly beaten to death for no reason at all. People also died of starvation. She told me about all the dead bodies. She couldn't believe there were so many dead bodies stacked up. I remember my mother having nightmares every night. When I was growing up, she had to have treatment for her nerves for more than seven years. She was marked for life by her experiences, but Letty was the camp that woke her up every night. She could never forget Letty. She lost her husband, her parents, and her children in Letty. She always spoke about the Czech guards who were responsible for taking her loved ones. My mother remarried in 1946. From her second marriage, she had six children. I have two brothers and three sisters. We have always lived in Liberets. Life wasn't very nice under communism here. There was discrimination, racism. We were second-class citizens under the communists, but the fascists were under control. We were protected by the Russians. The Czechs couldn't harm us then. But today reminds me of all the terrible stories my mother told me about the Czechs during World War II. My mother was never, my mother never expected the Czechs would take her to Leti, so I can't say what they're going to do to me. I fear the same thing may happen. She died in 1991. The last two years of her life, she feared because of the Velvet Revolution that she would be taken to another Leti before she died. I live next door to a restaurant where skinheads have a club. Three years ago, in 1993, on a Sunday afternoon, there was a soccer match with Ostrava. About 50 skinheads came on a bus for the match. I was repairing my car with my two sons. We didn't see the skinheads because they approached us from behind. Suddenly I was hit by a big stone on my back as I was leaning over the engine. I didn't hear the skinheads because the engine was running. When I turned around, there were 50 skinheads. I didn't know the exact number at that time. I just saw a big crowd. My two sons ran away. I tried to follow them, but one of the skinheads hit me over the head with a metal pipe. He never stopped beating me. I had my face broken from my forehead to my jaw. My nose was broken, two ribs, my kidneys were damaged, and I lost all my front teeth. According to the doctors, I also had brain damage. When the ambulance arrived to take me to the hospital, the doctor refused to treat me because he said I was a gypsy. After he walked away, another doctor who I knew helped me. When the ambulance arrived, the police came also. They arrested two skinheads. The next day in the hospital, the police asked me, asked me questions. I couldn't talk to them because of my condition. 
The doctor also told the police I was not in any condition to answer questions. The police told me after I left the hospital they would visit me again. I spent two months in a hospital, but the police wouldn't let anyone interview me. No newspapers, no TV, nothing. A television crew with a camera arrived the second day I was there, but the police didn't want any pictures of me. Two months later, the police came to visit me at home. I told them what had happened. They said my version was different from when they interviewed me in the hospital. I asked if the skinheads were in police custody. They said no. They said there was not enough evidence to prosecute. I insisted on a case. Half a year later, there was a court case. Three he skinheads were charged. There were 50 skinheads in the courtroom. The three skinheads who were charged now had long hair. The judge asked if I could still recognize them. I said yes. The skinheads said that they were not in that attack, probably someone else. It was not a serious trial. The judge said the skinheads could only be charged for creating a public disturbance, not for assault. It was such a farce, I told the judge it was nothing more than a theater play. The judge ordered two guards to throw me out. The 50 skinheads in the courtroom started laughing. Until now, I am still awaiting for my appeal to a higher court. My mother was beaten in Leti in 1942, and I was beaten even worse in Liberec in 1993. The Czechs are out to kill us, and I believe they will. I would like to immigrate to a country where there is real democracy, where there is no racism. I know that in the United States, the blacks have problems, but it can't be as bad as it is here. I see they make sport together. They are living together. But here, it's not that way. I have no hope for us in this country. It's chilling to, to hear this, that this is still going on. It happens every week, every week in the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. I have appealed to President Havel to help the Romani. He will entertain any Chinese dissident on his way to Washington, mm -hmm. but no Romani dissident is ever invited to the castle. Is there any sort of reason or explanation for this going on? Well, what, what do they have to gain by, uh, by, by attacking the Romani? As I told you, this problem has been going on for 600 years. Mm -hmm. The Romani came from India, arrived in the Czech Republic in the 14th century. King Charles IV, who built that beautiful bridge over the river in Prague, used to hunt Romani on horseback like other monarchs hunted wild deer and boar. Uh, at the Treaty of Versailles, when Czechoslovakia was created as a nation, all minorities living in Czechoslovakia were promised cit citizenship. The largest minority, the Germans got it. The second largest minority, the Gypsies, were denied citizenship. They didn't get citizenship until 1954 under the communists. I would like to, uh, since you uh, bring up uh, that uh, people were actually hunted by royalty on horseback, I would like to switch to the, uh, the poems in Living Through It Twice because I believe that was covered. Well, these poems go on from from 1940 till today, 1998, and and in these poems you you get a historical look at what has happened and what is still happening today. I'm not sure which poem uh, I should read, but but let me read you the last one, Romani Cobra, because it it gives a good idea of what the Romani had, have had to live through. Romani Cobra. My father and his brothers joined the Czech resistance to save our country when the Germans marched in. My father and his brothers knew the woods, knew the trails, knew how to smuggle guns and bombs across the border. My father and his brothers tried to teach the Czechs how to live in the forest, how to live off the land. But the Czechs weren't fighters. They were doctors, professors, businessmen who could learn, who couldn't learn to steal a farmer's dog and eat it. My father and his brothers founded Romani Cobra to rescue our relatives from Leti when the resistance returned to the cities. My father and his brothers gathered up Romanis who had escaped the police roundup 
by living in the forest treetops. My father and his brothers planned to attack Leti after they saw the old people and children dying like flies. But the Czechs heard about it from the Kapos, the informers, and sent everyone to Auschwitz two years before the war ended. My father and his brothers followed the railroad tracks to Poland. All along the way, they recruited Romani stragglers. My father and his brothers planned the attack on Auschwitz like our ancestors when they stole horses from the Gajos. My father and his brothers snuck into Auschwitz on the night of August the 1st, 1944, and caused the SS to retreat. But the Jews weren't fighters, they didn't want to rebel, so only about 300 gypsies escaped with us that night. My father and his brothers saved most of our family, most of our relatives, from the gas chambers, but not from the Czechs. My father and his brothers died of old age before the Velvet Re Revolution, before the skinheads were turned against us. My father and his brothers would have known what to do today. And now we think about them every time one of us is picked off. But there is a time and place for everything, and soon, very soon, Roman Cobra will turn every skinhead into a cinder, blacker than our faces. You were telling me uh, before the show that uh, in most places in Europe where there were concentration camps, the, con the camps had been preserved as monuments. But they didn't do that with Letty. Under the Helsinki agreements, all death camps from World War II are supposed to be maintained as remembrance sites. At Letty, the Czech government built a pig farm over the Holocaust site. Today, 14,300 pigs are desecrating the graves, the mass graves, of the Romani Holocaust victims. We have appealed to the Czech government for the past five years to remove this pig farm from a gypsy Holocaust site. That plea has fallen on deaf ears despite the Helsinki agreements. Um, I also understand from looking at, uh, at Black Silence that you had gone to the sites, uh, to Letty, and had originally had access to some archives, but uh, when they found out what you were doing with them, that you were having a lot of trouble. Yes, I discovered in the archive for South Bohemia over 40,000 documents that uh, survived the Letty camp. It gave many of the names of the people who were taken there, and I discovered many death certificates. The Czech government today claims that only 327 people died at Leti, all from typhus. But these documents demonstrate that thousands died at Leti, and of course thousands are buried in the mass graves. When I made this uh, information known to Holocaust historians, the Czech government uh, prevented me from going back into the archives. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get, uh, just to divert for a moment, sometimes we uh, get the impression that uh, poets don't really do anything useful in the world, and I would like anybody who thinks that to take note on this, because this is a very important project. I would like you, if you would, to do another uh, poem from Living Through It Twice. I'd like to read the first poem that starts off the collection. It's called Postcard from Prague. While I'm sitting at a cafe table writing postcards home from Prague, a gypsy boy comes over. He can't be older than eight. His dark skin and shiny black hair remind me of our Native Americans. No wonder Columbus called them Indians. A policeman on the corner nods to two skinheads in leather jackets. The silver rings in their ears don't shine in the sun. They chase the gypsy down a side street. He heads for the river as if he were a deer chased by wild, mad dogs, their brains turning into froth. Czechs and Germans sitting at the other tables cheer. The policeman smiles back, his thumb in the air like a flagpole, rigid, stern, correct. During President Havel's reign, over 2,000 gypsies have been attacked by Czech skinheads. Before leaving for an official visit to Auschwitz, Havel told Prague Radio, he still doesn't understand how the Holocaust 
could have happened in Europe. Hmm. I'd like to go into a little of your background. Um, you're originally from Iowa, I understand. Yes, I'm from Iowa. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my name, my surname Polanski is Czech. Mm -hmm. My grandparents were born in South Bohemia in the Czech Republic. And so for me, it's, it's even more painful to, to have Czech ancestry and yet blowing the whistle on this death camp that the Czechs ran instead of the Germans. It's very painful, but I feel that all Czechs, whether they're Czech Americans or Czechs from the Czech Republic, must face up to our own history. Mm -hmm. did, you, uh, did you do much writing as a, uh, as a child? Yes, I of course worked on the school newspaper when I was in high school and mm -hmm. I went to college and majored in journalism and English literature and later I made my life abroad. I've lived in Europe for over 35 years. But there, was there anything in your in your formative years that even remotely prepared you for what finally uh, happened in your life uh, examining this problem? I don't think so, except my, my parents always made me aware of minority peoples, although my mother was born and baptized a Roman Catholic. Her mother always uh, cooked for the local rabbi, made his robes. We were always uh, in a neighborhood that had lots of minorities. We grew up with them as our neighbors. And so to me, uh, it was the most common thing on earth to live next door to someone who was different. And when I got to the Czech Republic and I saw that they were killing people only because they were different and for no other reason, it was such a shock, it, it made me react, and this is how I've reacted, through the pen. Speaking of different, um, you've gone to a number of, of foreign countries. Um, you're working on a project dealing with Angola. Well, I guess I have a bit of gypsy blood in me. I like to travel. Mm -hmm. And in 1975, I was in Angola on a safari. I... Uh, still had this notion that Hemingway planted in my head that big game hunting was supposed to be mm -hmm. quite romantic, as it turned out it wasn't. And while I was there, I got caught up in the Civil War. And recently I've looked back on that experience. I've tried to cut away the romanticism that is supposed to be associated with big game hunting, killing animals. And I've written a cycle of poems based on my memories. Can you give us a taste of that? Okay. <laughs> Here's a poem called A Distraught Father. A distraught black man came into our camp one night. He had walked for over a day to find us. A leopard had carried off his son. He wanted us to find and kill the big cat. The black man looked about 90, thin with gray stubble. He said he had a goat herd and young wives. The son had been her attending the herd when he was carried off. It took us three hours to drive the man back to his village six or seven mud huts surrounded by dried out thorn bushes. The old man's wives were still howling. Our bushman tracked the leopard for about a mile. We found the boy's half-eaten body in the fork of a tall tree. Pedro told the old man we had to leave the boy's body there as bait. We built a blind about a hundred yards away. It was Jack's turn to shoot first, but he didn't want the responsibility. Neither did I. Pedro said he would kill the leopard, but he wanted to keep the skin. The father agreed. The big cat came back around midnight. It was a noisy, he was a noisy eater. I couldn't see him in the tree, but Pedro dropped him with one shot. There was no celebration, not even a thank you. I was struck by one, one line in particular, Jack's turn to shoot first. Well, we were two... Americans on a big game safari and uh, 
Pedro was our white hunter guide. Mm -hmm. And as we went out looking for trophies, we took turns as the game presented itself. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I noticed you had one other collection in there, Stray Dog. What is that about? Stray Dog is a collection of poems about violence inside and outside the boxing ring. Mm -hmm. I have written that cycle of poems trying to understand the origins of violence. Mm -hmm. Can we do a, uh, a quick poem from there? Well, I hope S I can. The subtitle, Poems of a Fighting Freak, I notice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even a couple of stanzas. Uh, let me... This poem is entitled Fear. Fear is in all of us, even in fighters. That's why we fight, to exercise that sin. Men aren't supposed to be afraid. We are. That's why we always have to prove ourselves. I used to shake badly just before a fight. Hands would sweat, smell worse than my feet. But all fear was forgotten with that first punch, especially if I got hit first. Then something inside me took over and I was in another world, experiencing the most glorious heavenly feeling a man can have while destroying, while destroying his own kind. And it seems like we do an awful lot of that for fun. Unfortunately, after interviewing over a hundred Holocaust survivors, to me, it seems it's not German killing Jew and not Czech killing Gypsy, but man killing man. Mm -hmm. On that note, uh, Paul Polanski, I want to thank you for coming on Poet the Poet and reminding us about our darker sides. Thank you for having me.